Okay, well, good. Good morning to all of you. Uh, this hearing will come to order. I want to uh, first welcome all of our witnesses to today's hearing. Uh, we appreciate uh, your service to the nation and your assistance to the subcommittee as we carry out our oversight responsibilities. In particular, I would like to thank uh, Colonel Bachman and his review committee for their efforts to provide uh, NASA and the Congress with an independent assessment of NASA's astronaut health care system. I'd also like to thank Administrator Griffin for his willingness to ask for such a review. Uh, I think it was a good decision that reflects well on the agency. It's clear to me and I think uh, all Americans that uh, NASA's astronauts represent the nation's best and brightest. We all respect their skill and bravery. In carrying out their challenging missions, they often make it look so easy that we sometimes uh, forget that there are human beings who face the same medical and behavioral issues that the rest of us have to deal with, along with the added rigors of uh, high stress jobs, long hours of training, extended absences from families and friends in high risk space flights. It's thus uh, critically important that NASA ensure that the astronauts be provided with the best possible medical and behavioral care throughout their careers. In addition, NASA astronauts, flight surgeons, and support personnel need to be confident that the lines of communication within the agency are open and responsive so that concerns can be quickly identified and addressed in a manner that maintains the level of trust so vital to safety and optimal performance. I don't think anyone inside NASA would disagree with those goals. That is why after reviewing Colonel Bachman's committee's report, I decided that this subcommittee needed to hold a hearing to examine the report's findings and recommendations. However, my decision was not made for the reasons uh, you might think. While there's been a great deal of attention given to the finding related to alcohol use, and I have little doubt that there will be discussion of that finding at today's hearing too, I think we do a real disservice to the Independent Review Committee if we ignore the warning flags they are raising about the state of communications within the agency on both medical and behavioral matters affecting the astronauts. Let me read just a few of the findings from the report that I think should concern us all. Many anecdotes, and, and I'm now quoting, quoting from the report, were related that involved risky behaviors by astronauts that were well known to the other astronauts and no apparent action was taken. Peers and staff fear ostracism if they identify their own or others' problems. Uh, to continue, uh, quoting from the report, several senior flight surgeons expressed their belief that their medical opinions regarding astronaut fitness for duty flight safety and mission accomplishment were not valued by leadership other than to validate that all medical systems were go for an on-time mission completion. Instances were described where major crew medical or behavioral problems were identified uh, to astronaut leadership and the medical advice was disregarded. This disregard was described as demoralizing to the point where they said they are less likely to report concerns of performance uh, decrement. Crew members raised concerns regarding substandard astronaut task performance, which were similarly uh, disregarded. As the review progressed, again, I'm quoting from the report, it became apparent that major vulnerabilities underlying root causes and contributing factors extend well beyond the specific medical aspects of NASA operations. These issues are so ingrained and longstanding that it will take senior leadership action to remediate them. There is no periodic psychological evaluation or testing conducted on astronauts. Once selected as an astronaut candidate, astronauts have no psychological evaluation for the remainder of their careers unless selected for long duration missions. Astronaut medical and behavioral health care is highly fragmented. Uh, that ends uh, quoting directly uh, from the report itself. Uh, and I don't uh, think anyone can listen to those findings and think all is well within NASA's astronaut health care system. This subcommittee needs to hear from Colonel Bachman the basis for his review panel's findings. Equally important, the subcommittee needs to hear from NASA management their plans for addressing the concerns raised by the independent review, not just the alcohol-related ones. Whatever the merits of focusing the agency's attention on trying to get employees to publicly verify or refute reports of alcohol use that those employees had provided in confidence to the independent review committee, I think it runs the risk of unintentionally worsening a communications environment at NASA in which, to quote the Independent Review Committee, peers and staff fear ostracism if they identify their own or others' problems. Instead, it may be more appropriate to take the disconnect what's uh, 
what is being said in private and what is being said in public by NASA personnel as another indicator that the broader issues raised by the Independent Review Committee warrant close and sustained attention. And I certainly hope that that will be the approach taken in the days and weeks ahead. Well, we, uh, we have a great deal to examine today. I again want to welcome our witnesses and I look forward uh, to your testimony. The uh, chair uh, now is uh, pleased to recognize uh, the, the gentleman from Florida, the uh, ranking member, uh, Mr. Feeney, for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this, uh, this important hearing. I want to um, uh, tell you that it's important enough that the ranking member of the full committee, the esteemed Mr. Hall, is here. I offered to defer to let him give the first opening speech, but he thought our weak, weakest link ought to go first. So, uh, <laughs> but we, we take the challenges that NASA has in the behavioral and the physical and the psychological well-being is very, very important. And this is an opportunity both for oversight committees of Congress and NASA and other outside experts to uh, find ways to dramatically improve as we go forward the well-being of astronauts in a wide variety of areas. After the Lisa Nowak incident earlier this year, NASA Administrator Mike Griffin, to his credit, convened the NASA Astronaut Health Care System Review Committee. I want to thank this distinguished panel of aerospace medical experts for their service. I also want to commend Administrator Griffin for inviting independent review of the health care system. We can put the report's sensationalistic element aside for a moment. The committee provided several thoughtful recommendations to heighten the importance of human factors to improve the monitoring of each astronaut's physical and mental well-being. After the shuttle is retired, NASA's Constellation program will return Americans to the moon for extended stays. As an astronaut's physical and psychological well-being will be more important in the future of America's space program and not less important. So it's imperative to thoroughly examine this issue and establish an astronaut health care system that properly addresses future and not just current medical concerns. I note that one of the challenges in going beyond low Earth orbit with human beings, even bigger perhaps than the mechanical and technical and scientific challenges, are the physiological challenges on astronauts that will spend extended periods in space. Unfortunately, the report's sensationalistic element, specifically allegations of astronaut intoxication shortly before spaceflight, drowned out the remainder of the report. Since the report's issuance in late July, these allegations remain uncorroborated. No eyewitness has come forward to specifically state who, what, when, and where. So far, the search for corroboration reveals the shortcomings of relying on anonymous allegations. And I know that the Colonel Bachman's committee had its mission, and it did it well. And there are advantages to having anonymous and voluntary people come forward, but there are disadvantages too. While anonymity, anonymity can certainly promote candor, but without corroboration, such allegations often unfairly force good men and good women to prove a negative. My office has heard from astronauts and NASA officials all deeply devoted to human spaceflight and highly credible who adamantly deny this misbehavior represents current or recent conduct. These people have longstanding firsthand knowledge of the astronaut program and simply state that alcohol influence during the immediate pre-flight period does not exist. Because an astronaut interacts with so many people during this period, I find it difficult to believe that such behavior could go undetected. But I don't want the alcohol issue to detract from a more troublesome finding that flight surgeons and astronauts in general may be hesitant to report major crew medical or behavioral problems because their concerns would be disregarded or ignored. And James Oberg, a distinguished and respected space commentator, followed up last month with a very thoughtful story detailing inconsistent approaches to significant astronaut health concerns. I want to applaud NASA for being open to the committee's recommendations, and I join the distinguished chairman of this subcommittee in suggesting that we focus on the future and how we can improve astronaut safety and well-being, and I think that's the approach NASA should and will take. This type of culture, formerly called a normalization of deviance after the first shuttle disaster, has contributed now to two shuttle accidents. It cannot be allowed to flourish in the most demanding of human endeavors, that is human spaceflight. We have to be ever vigilant against such behavior, and I'm very much appreciative for Chairman Udall for calling this hearing. 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Feeney. Uh, at this point, I'm pleased to acknowledge the presence of the chairman uh, of the full committee, Chairman Bart Gordon, at the hearing. And I'd like to ask unanimous consent to recognize him for any remarks uh, he would like to make. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Chairman Udall. Let me, let me say that you and Ranking Member Finney have made my job a lot easier. You have summed it up very well. Uh, I think there is a bipartisan uh, uh, interest, obviously, in this issue. And um, although the alcohol issues um, got a lot of the early publicity and certainly is something to be concerned about, in all reports, it, I think it indicates that that was a, a, a very um, um, a situation that was an anomaly. Uh, the, the bigger concern is, is there an openness, is there a comfortableness within the NASA organization uh, to other issues of flight safety? Um, and we have different, different, I mean, we just have different testimony here. And um, I think that what I know is that, that, that there's certainly smoke. Uh, whether there's fire, we want to be able to determine that today. I have no question that that both panels are of, are of individuals of integrity trying to do uh, the right thing. And I think this will be a healthy um, exercise for NASA. Uh, but the real question is, you know, is there that comfortableness uh, within the NASA uh, flight safety operation that allows everyone to step forward uh, without feeling somehow they're ostracized, without s feeling somehow they've been demoralized, uh, quoting the report uh, about prior overlooks. So um, I, again, I welcome and I think uh, Mr. Uh, Feeney and Mr. Udall have summed up our charge today and I look forward to hearing this testimony and some interaction between uh, the members of uh, the panels. Thank you, Chairman Gordon. Uh, as uh, Mr. Feeney noted, uh, the ranking member, um, Mr. Hall, uh, is also present. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that he also be recognized for any opening remarks he would care to make. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I thank you for doing what you're doing. I realize that you had to do it, and uh, uh, Bart Garden is a fine chairman and a great native Tennessean, and I admire him very much, enjoy working with him. But you know, I'm so pro NASA and pro space and pro Mike Griffin that it, it's just really uh, something that uh, accusations sound more to me like uh, someone that's wanting to be quoted rather than something that might have happened by our most red, white, and blue members of uh, public service at any any stage here. Our very finest educated uh, uh, men and women that. Uh, put their life in the hands of those of us who light the, the uh, stick of dynamite that sends them off, uh, just above and beyond public servants. And I hate to even see a, a, a hearing on something like this, but I understand the chairman that it's something when you have these allegations, you have to hear it and you have to, it's the best to clear the air and I hope we can do that here. And I, I do want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for and I thank the panelists for being here today to speak on, on this health, health reports. What I'd like to look at it as is most of you know I've, I've been a long time supporter of astronaut safety and indeed it's been my primary goal in relation to the U.S. space program. And I've argued for years that we need to do everything we can to ensure that the men and women who are launched into outer space are prepared and equipped with everything they need to do the job and return to Earth safely. I believe this is also the goal of each and every person working on the shuttle program at, at NASA. Uh, in the wake of the Columbia disaster, Congress uh, held a series of investigations aimed at addressing the problems that led to the accident. And these investigations uh, culminated with the CAIB report that outlined suggestions for NASA. So I know that Administrator Griffin and his team have taken these suggestions seriously and have implemented a series of changes at NASA to address the concerns. I don't look forward to the hearing, but I do look forward to staying here and listening uh, to the testimony, particularly from the administrator on the progress of these changes and what NASA can do to continue to improve as we move forward. And as my good friend, Representative Feeney, points out, we need to continue to be vigilant. And as this chairman is going to do, I know him from knowing him and his family before him that they'll address problems and they meet problems head on uh, at NASA and everywhere else uh, so that there's a culture of safety that 
prevails. Uh, I, I look forward to the hearing and I yield back my time and I thank the chair. I thank the ranking member for his, his always insightful remarks and uh, look forward to his participation further in the hearing. Uh, if there are other members uh, who wish to submit additional opening statements, uh, your statements will be added to the record uh, without objection so ordered. Uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to turn uh, to the panel and, and recognize our first panel of witnesses. I'd like to uh, introduce everybody in the panel, and then we'll come back and start to, with Colonel Bachman. And I did want to initially introduce uh, Colonel Richard E. Bachman, who's the, appearing before the subcommittee today in his capacity as the chair of the NASA Astronaut Healthcare System Review Committee. Uh, to Colonel Bachman's uh, left is, is Dr. Richard uh, S. Williams, who's the Chief Health and Medical Officer at NASA. Uh, further to, uh, uh, to the left on the, the, the table is uh, Dr. Ellen Ocho, who's the Director of Flight Crew Operations uh, at NASA. And uh, our last witness on the first panel we have, uh, Mr. Brian O'Connor, the Chief of Safety and Mission Assurance at NASA, a very esteemed and, and highly qualified uh, panel. Uh, welcome to all of you. As uh, our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which members of the subcommittee, and in this case the full uh, committee, will have five minutes each to ask questions. So we'll begin with uh, Colonel Bachman. Thank you for being here, and the floor is yours, Colonel. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, good morning. It is truly an honor for me to speak to you today about the findings of the NASA Astronaut Health Care System Review Committee. NASA chartered this committee and selected the members to review the medical and behavioral health care that is provided to astronauts, provide opinions as to what, if any, procedures or testing could be put in place to predict disordered conduct or acts of passion. The entire report, each finding and recommendation, was approved and is supported unanimously by the entire committee. The work of further evaluation and action on the information contained within the report falls to NASA. The committee reviewed documents and conducted interviews of medical, behavioral health, astronauts, and family members. Because we were focused on systems issues rather than the behavior of specific individuals, we encouraged NASA personnel to speak freely and assured them that the report would not include any personally identifiable information. As the review progressed, it became apparent that major vulnerabilities, underlying root causes, and contributing factors extend well beyond the specific medical aspects of NASA operations. The report's most important issues and risks can be summarized in the following three areas. First, NASA personnel feel strongly that human factors concerns are disregarded to the point where they are reluctant to identify such concerns in the future. Second, that supervisors, peers, and other NASA personnel must be empowered and expected to enforce standards of conduct. And third, that medical and behavioral health services should be integrated and focused on astronaut performance enhancement. The perceived disregard of human factors concerns has the greatest safety implications and demands immediate attention. Unfortunately, a disproportionate amount of attention has been focused on astronaut alcohol use. Separately, NASA astronauts and medical personnel described two specific instances of alcohol use to the committee as examples of a much larger issue that NASA personnel felt that human factors concerns with significant safety implications had been disregarded when raised to local on-scene leadership. The interviewees were eyewitnesses to the events and provided the information voluntarily and unprompted to the committee. We wish to emphasize again that the specifics of the incidents should not be the focus of the attention. The general sense of disregard for human factors described as demoralizing to the point where NASA personnel are less likely to report concerns of performance decrement is the fundamental concern NASA must investigate and remedy. We understand the outrage that some NAF members of NASA have expressed at this particular finding. However, public statements that such things are simply impossible, challenging the veracity of the findings, referring to them as unproven allegations or urban legends, rather than acknowledging how difficult raising such concerns can be, do not encourage openness and safety, make future reporting even less likely, and increase the risk of future mishaps or incidents. The recently released NASA Space Flight Safety Review did not prove that the evidence described to us did not happen, only that NASA personnel who shared their concerns with the committee during the interviews did not bring these same concerns forward during the safety review. We believe this may represent continued fear and barriers to communication 
and may be a cause for greater, not less, concern. The committee identified a number of structural and cultural issues that currently exist in NASA that make it even more difficult to predict an episode of disordered conduct and made recommendations to ameliorate them. These recommendations include instituting a formal written code of conduct, creating enduring supervisory mentoring relationships with effective feedback and evaluation, and empowering supervisors, peers, and support staff to bring forward concerns. Solutions will require a systems-based approach. NASA has acknowledged the intent to act upon most, if not all, of these recommendations. Each finding and recommendation should be explicitly addressed and tracked to resolution with both internal and external oversight. We believe the first and most important step that needs to be taken by NASA is to conduct a thorough, appropriately constructed, anonymous survey of the relevant populations covered by this report. This survey must be carefully worded in order to obtain valid, actionable information. NASA senior leadership must provide vocal support for the survey and encourage NASA personnel to be open, honest, and thorough in their replies. They must be assured of anonymity, freedom from reprisal, and that the information will be used appropriately, otherwise the concerns will be driven further underground. Only with such a comprehensive, anonymous, valid, and visibly supported survey can NASA truly determine the scope of the problems and drive toward system solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Bachman. Uh, Dr. Williams is recognized. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the NASA Astronaut Medical and Behavioral Health Care Program. I'm pleased to provide you with insight into this comprehensive program and discuss our plans regarding the findings of the NASA Astronaut Health Care System Review Committee and the internal review conducted at Johnson Space Center. The NASA Astronaut Medical Behavioral Health Care Program and has succeeded in keeping our astronauts healthy and ready to perform the challenging tasks that NASA asks of them. Over the course of our nation's 40-year human spaceflight endeavor, the healthcare system has contributed to the success of all NASA human spaceflight missions. No mission has thus far been abbreviated or terminated because of a healthcare issue. Longer duration exploration missions will provide new challenges and we are committed to ensuring our program continues to provide the best medical and behavioral health care to the the health-related recommendations of the Astronaut Health Care System Review Committee are thoughtful and will contribute to meeting the behavioral health challenges that lie ahead. We take the recommendations of the Review Committee seriously, and we thank the Committee for all the time and effort involved in their study. Our overarching goal is to improve behavioral health and medical care for the astronauts. Several of the Committee recommendations were accepted immediately, and many more will be accepted in the coming months. Specifically, NASA accepts the recommendations concerning analysis and use of behavioral health data and will convene experts to address psychological testing as recommended. Briefings by the flight surgeons to crew members concerning medical monitoring activities and briefings by principal investigators concerning research data collection in the context of obtaining informed consent will be reemphasized. Effective communication between astronauts and flight surgeons will be addressed. We will ensure both groups are aware of the multiple pathways to communicate safety and health concerns. And we'll be working together in support of NASA senior leadership to reinforce these concepts. Flight surgeon scheduling and task assignment and flight medicine clinic operations will be closely examined with the goal of enhancing continuity of care to the greatest extent feasible. Options for providing effective behavioral health services to all flight assignable astronauts for the purposes of performance enhancement, performance enhancement will be reviewed and a behavioral health assessment will be conducted as part of the annual astronaut physical examination. Options for flight surgeon behavioral health assessment training will also be identified. A common credentialing and privileging process will be applied to behavioral health and aeromedical services and peer review of practice will be enhanced for both. NASA's electronic medical record system will be re-examined to provide maximum privacy consistent with safe medical practice and compliance with all applicable statutes and regulation governing privacy of medical information will be assured. Process linkages between the behavioral health record system and the electronic medical record will be reviewed and established and all appropriately credentialed and privileged practitioners will be granted records access as appropriate. NASA will examine options for assuring quality of care delivered by community consultants and practitioners. Written operational instructions and procedures for the behavioral health clinic will be examined and enhanced as appropriate. 
The Aerospace Medicine Board Charter will be reviewed and updated to reflect appropriate membership, authority, and accountability. Regular meetings will be scheduled between behavioral health staff and flight surgeons to enhance clinical communication. Our initial responses to the committee's recommendation were reviewed and endorsed by the NASA Medical Policy Board on August 21, 2007. The Medical Policy Board, consisting of medical experts, both external and internal to NASA, is available to me for consultation on all NASA medical policy matters. The Medical Policy Board will provide ongoing implementation oversight, and I will provide progress reports to the NASA. Commitment to flight safety remains the foundation of our effort and we look forward to system improvements that will be realized as a result of this report. I look forward to answering any questions you may have this morning. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, Dr. Ochoa, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I have the privilege of managing the organization that includes the Astronaut Office and the Aircraft Operations Division at NASA Johnson Space Center. Prior to becoming Director of Flight Crew Operations a year ago and Deputy Director four years before that, I was a member of the Astronaut Office for 12 years and was fortunate enough to fly on four space shuttle missions. In my experience, astronauts prepare thoroughly and uncompromisingly for their missions. One of my crewmates compared it to preparing for the Olympics. Every act, every day, is designed to make sure that you are at your peak both mentally and physically when you launch into space. About 10 years ago, as we began assembly of the International Space Station, it became clear that astronaut preparation needed to be raised to a new level to accomplish the increased complexity of establishing and maintaining a permanent human presence in space. Along with the Mission Operations Directorate, whose job is to plan, train, and fly missions, and the Space Life Sciences Directorate, who ensures the crew health, the Flight Crew Operations Directorate developed new processes, training, evaluation methods, and fitness standards to meet the challenge of assembling and operating the space station. Standards for fitness for duty are determined, measured, and documented using a number of processes and tools. Comments and quantitative evaluations by instructors are documented in every phase of training and including it in each astronaut's personnel file. In addition to training in many areas ranging from spacecraft systems to robotics and spacewalking to expedition preparation, NASA uses other processes to prepare and evaluate astronauts, including the Instructor Astronaut Program, the Commander Upgrade Program, and the Astronaut Evaluation Board. All of these are used by the Chief of the Astronaut Office in the Flight Assignment Recommendation Process. Medical standards for flight are used by the Aerospace Medicine Board to make certification decisions. The certification results are addressed during biweekly meetings between astronaut and flight surgeon management. The communication and relationship between flight crew operations and the space medicine community is strong, allowing NASA to effectively address concerns regarding crew health and fitness. Flight surgeons are aware of their responsibility to assure that an astronaut's health or behavior does not present a risk to themselves or the mission. And the flight crew management, as well as NASA's leadership, support their efforts to do so. Flight crews are very fortunate to have a group of flight surgeons who are not only excellent physicians, but who understand the training and the operational environment of an astronaut and the implications of that, astronaut, of that environment to astronaut health. The flight surgeons are dedicated to maintaining or returning astronauts to flight status when at all possible, keeping within the medical standards that protect health and mission success. Following the events of last February, Johnson Space Center conducted an internal assessment and NASA headquarters charted the Astronaut Health Care Review Committee. While behavioral health recommendations were the focus of the Health Care Committee report, the report also included a number of comments related to astronaut office behavior and processes. As the committee itself noted, they did not attempt to determine the veracity of those comments, nor was there any request for information on astronaut office processes, policies, or anything that could be characterized as astronaut office culture. In response to the committee report, NASA has taken decisive steps. Brian O'Connor's thorough investigation confirmed my own personal experience as both a crew member and a manager of flight crew. We have found no instance where astronauts have used alcohol in the immediate pre-flight period or were under the effects or influence of alcohol at launch. 
and no case where a flight surgeon or astronaut raised a concern about this to management. NASA has also responded to the committee's report by developing an anonymous survey to determine what issues actually exist and their scope. This survey will be provided to the astronaut corps and flight surgeons this month. Both groups will be asked to respond to questions regarding communication, trust, and responsibilities, and regarding potential concerns or barriers to raising issues with flight safety or crew suitability for flight. Additionally, astronauts will be asked about policies and procedures dealing with astronaut performance and feedback, crew assignment, and spaceflight alcohol use. NASA will then develop a plan to address any issues identified by the survey report, a course of action that the committee indicated they intended as NASA's response. In conclusion, I'm extremely proud to represent the astronaut office, both within NASA and externally, to the members of this committee, to the media, and to the public. Our astronauts are well prepared to carry out the nation's human spaceflight program. They take their responsibility very seriously. The same can be said of the entire NASA team that prepares and executes human spaceflight missions. The real proof of that lies in the tremendous accomplishments of our human spaceflight programs, accomplishments made possible by the dedicated people at NASA, our engineers, flight controllers, scientists, doctors, and astronauts. I would be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ochoa. Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee and the committee, thank you for this opportunity to address you on the subject of spaceflight crew safety. As NASA's Chief of Safety and Mission Assurance, I report directly to our administrator on matters dealing with ground safety and flight safety. And I also have policy and functional oversight responsibility for this agency for the safety organizations assigned to each of the centers across the agency. My organizational relationships with flight crew operations and with the chief health and medical officer are included in my written remarks. In its final report, dated 27 July 2007, the Astronaut Health Care System Review Committee found the following, quote, interviews with flight surgeons and astronauts identified episodes of heavy use of alcohol by astronauts in the immediate pre-flight period which led to flight safety concerns. Two specific instances were described where astronauts had been so intoxicated prior to flight that flight surgeons and or fellow astronauts raised concerns to local on-scene leadership regarding flight safety. However, the individuals were still permitted to fly. In response, the Deputy Administrator appointed me to review the reported allegations. The purpose of my review was twofold. Number one, evaluate the Committee's finding related to the inappropriate use of ab or abuse of alcohol by astronauts in the immediate pre-flight space flight period. And two, evaluate relevant existing policies covering alcohol use and abuse at NASA. My approach to the review was to learn as much as I could about the reported allegations through interviews, data searches, and history review. The goal here was to establish the nature and the scope of any flight crew alcohol abuse, thus enabling a more informed course of action in our policies, procedures, risk mitigation strategies, our authority structure and communication systems. The scope of my review was limited to spaceflight with focus on the activities on launch day from crew wake up until launch. For this potential flight safety issue, the relevant question was, did we have an instance where a crew member presented on launch morning in an impaired state, was observed as such by the flight surgeon or another crew member, and then over their objections was cleared to fly that day by operational management? Consistent with our standard approach to anonymous safety concerns, my investigative method included a search of over 1,500 anonymous reporting system and confidential hotline reports going back to 1987 when we first established the NASA safety reporting system. And with the help of the NASA Safety Center, we searched literally tens of thousands of mishap and close call records going back that same length of time. I received inputs by phone, email, in person from over 130 individuals who have been involved one way or another in activities during the last few days before launch either at the Kennedy Space Center or at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. I heard from every one of our current operational flight surgeons and nearly 80 percent of the current astronaut corps and many former astronauts. I also talked to suit technicians, medical staff, operational managers, crew quarters managers, food preparation and, and service staff, 
and closeout crew technicians. The closeout crew are the last people to see the crew before launch. To supplement this review, I reminded members of the flight community at all times that they should be, use the hotlines and the NASA safety reporting system for any flight safety information they felt reluctant to provide to me in an open forum. And I reviewed those hotlines and NSRS system throughout. The NAS also, NASA is preparing a focused anonymous survey as a follow-up to this. This survey will try to flush out any residual concerns in this or other areas covered by the committee report. Within the scope and the limitations of my review, I was not able to verify any case in which an astronaut spaceflight crew member was impaired on launch day or any case where a NASA manager disregarded recommendations by a flight surgeon or another crew member that an astronaut crew member not be allowed to fly on the shuttle or the Soyuz. Should such a situation present itself in the future, I'm confident from my review that there are reasonable safeguards in place, including such things as the flight surgeon check that morning, the presence of flight crew managers, TV cameras, suit technicians, and other technical and administrative staff and supervisors that would keep us from ever allowing an impaired crew member from boarding a spacecraft. As for the chance that we will disregard a flight surgeon or a crew member safety concerns, I found that although there may be occasional disagreements among operations and medical team members, all parties understood their roles and authorities and the multiple safety reporting and appeal paths we have put in place, some as late as the last two years. My report makes one recommendation to improve flight surgeon oversight during launch day activities and several recommendations concerning relevant agency policies that should be improved for scope and clarity. This review is complete, but I have reminded our workforce that any alcohol abuse or other flight safety threats should be reported in an open forum or, if necessary, through any one of the several anonymous reporting systems we have in place at NASA. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Thank, thank you to the panel. Uh, we, uh, I should give everybody an update. We have a looming uh, set of votes, but we're going to start now with the uh, first round of questions, and we'll play it by ear because we do really want to hear from, from everybody on the panel, give everybody on the dais a chance to ask their questions. Uh, at this point, the chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Um, Colonel Bachman, uh, I'd like to focus on... Uh, your testimony, and I, I speak for myself, I, although I think I might speak for other members of the subcommittee when I say it's hard for us to hear your testimony followed by that of the NASA witnesses and not be somewhat troubled. Uh, on the one hand, uh, your committee found that, uh, quote, quoting you, several senior flight surgeons expressed their belief that their medical opinions regarding <coughs> astronaut fitness for duty, flight safety, and mission accomplishments were not valued by leadership other than to validate that all medical systems were go for an on-time mission completion. And to continue, instances were described where major crew medical or behavioral problems were identified to astronaut leadership and the medical advice was disregarded. And finally, your uh, testimony uh, and your committee uh, relayed the following. Crew members raised concerns regarding substandard astronaut task performance, which were similarly disregarded. Uh, I then contrast that with Mr. O'Connor's Space Flight Safety Review Report in which he includes an email letter from all of the JSC Mission Operations Flight Surgeons in which they state, in the course of astronaut mission operations and training, our safety and medical concerns have not been ignored by NASA Medical Operations, the Astronaut Office, Mission Dire Operations Directorate, the Aircraft Operations Directorate, and ISS and Shuttle Program Management. And then with Dr. Ochoa's written testimony which states that the communication and relationship between flight crew operations and the space medicine community is strong and effective, allowing NASA to effectively address concerns regarding safety and crew health. Uh, to pick up on what Chairman Gordon said uh, in his remarks, it almost seems uh, as though we're hearing about two completely different organizations. Uh, why did your committee paint such a different picture than the one that NASA personnel are describing to the subcommittee? And, and could you provide some specifics to help us better understand the basis for your committee's findings? Yes, sir. And I agree that um, the, the pictures that are painted by the two reports are diametrically in opposition. Any answer about why would be speculation on my part. Uh, what the committee gathered together and wrote 
in the report and unanimously supports is what the astronauts and flight surgeons told us either face to face or over the phone during the course of our committee evalu investigation evaluation. The fact that they are not coming forward with similar concerns uh, when NASA asked the question, I believe still represents a problem. Uh, the why uh, I think is a barrier to communication and, and concern about what's going to happen to them and what's going to be done with the information. That's why we really uh, put a great deal of emphasis on the anonymous survey so that people will feel that they can speak freely. Returning to your uh, report, uh, Colonel, uh, many of the cultural and structural issues identified in, in this report, I'm again quoting from uh, what your committee wrote uh, as, let me start over, many of the cultural and structural issues identified in this report as problematic have existed for many years and some have existed since the earliest days of the space program. These issues are so ingrained and longstanding that it will take a senior leadership action to remediate them. Uh, these are uh, sobering words. and. Uh, could you give me one or two examples of the cultural and structural issues your committee is, is talking about? Please keep in mind that the makeup of the committee was very diverse. We had uh, military uh, flight surgeons and behavioral health experts. We had uh, civilians. Uh, all but one of the members of the committee had some military experience, uh, but we did have a member from the VA uh, who uh, did not. We are familiar with the military environment, behavior of, of highly skilled, highly professional, uh, highly selected uh, groups of people uh, that still have human issues. They still fall victim to all the same kinds of issues that we do. Um, there are doctors and uh, military pilots and airline pilots who have trouble with drinking alcohol when they shouldn't. Uh, we have behavior problems that come as a surprise to coworkers. And I think NASA is no different in that regard. And not to speak poorly of the astronaut corps, we think very highly of the astronauts, uh, but we still remember that they are humans and fall victim to the same kinds of things we do. The issues of the kinds of behaviors that are described should not come as a surprise to anybody who deals with people. Uh, the concern for us was that they are, they are, they seem to come as a surprise because astronauts are so very good. It's still unreasonable to think that they won't have individuals that have problems with alcohol, that they won't have individuals have problems uh, with marital relationships, with money, uh, and they need to set up a system where they can identify folks that are straying from the path sooner uh, and do something about it before it becomes a major issue. Thank you, Colonel Bachman. I want to recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Feeney, and I'm hopeful we might also be able to recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Gordon. Before we have to go to the floor to vote, we'll recess the committee temporarily. Mr. Well, <clears throat> well, thank you. And um, I, I guess I'm hesitant to ask what may be the silliest question of uh, 2007. But, um, Mr. O'Connor, just why would it be a great risk if an astronaut or astronauts had um, had too much to drink before flight? Um, I've been in the in the simulator. I know that the medical risks of, for example, vomiting into your mask are important, uh, but the if the, f if the launch is successful, the truth of the matter is that it's all technical and computer driven. It's actually the emergency landing that is a concern. And other than it being poor practice, are there other concerns with, because this, the Soviets do have this tradition where shortly before takeoff, they have a toast and you outline that it's basically just touching to the lips. But um, in any event, it may be a silly question, but what other threats other than vomiting or the inability for somebody to safely land if there's an emergency landing, uh, would there be if astronauts were drinking immediately prior to flight? Um, well, sir, um, let's say we had a crew of seven members getting ready to fly the shuttle, and one of those members really didn't have much to do for the first three days of the mission. And then on day four, they start working on some experiment. Um, even that crew member needs to be ready for an egress on the, on the launch pad. Every single one of those crew members has to be able to convince their commander when they get on board that they would be able to, in emergency, get out without assistance in case of an emergency on the launch pad, no matter what. 
And, uh, and that really is the first challenge, I believe, even before they light off the vehicle and launch, is to have a crew that's fit and they have their minds in order and they are not going to need to be pulled out of the cockpit by somebody else putting the crew at risk. Not to mention that if, if one of them were caught to be drinking, you'd have to cancel the whole flight potentially if you didn't have anybody ready to step in. Well, that was part of my, um, my review was to look at that launch day. Is it possible that someone could actually wind up in the cockpit impaired? And if so, what sort of factors do we have in place to prevent that from happening? Um, I, I found it really hard to imagine that, we, that you could get there. But let's say it wasn't alcohol. Let's say somebody fell down the stairs on their way to get suited up or banged their head into something or had a stroke. Uh, and they were perfectly fine the last time the flight surgeon looked at them. Uh, we still need to be able to look them in the eye, have the flight surgeon nearby, even to the point where they walk out of the building. And, uh, and I think that's one of the concerns that we had, was that impairment by any means is something we want to prevent. And we would hold off a launch, just as we did on STS-36 some years ago when the crew had a sick crew member. We, the flight surgeon went to management, said we got a sick crew member, management really didn't want to hear this. They were right in the middle of the launch countdown. And, uh, and yet, they had to agree. Crew member sick, let us know when he's ready to go and we'll launch. So we held off for two days. Colonel Bachman and, and Mr. O'Connor, on, on the much bigger issue, and that is whether there is still a cultural problem with the comfort of reporting safety, whether it's technical. And by the way, I was there when Mike Griffin recognized a technician that recognized uh, on the wing, I think it was, uh, maybe he'll address it later, in front of uh, God and country and the press and other NASA employees and administrators, he recognized somebody that was literally a hero because he was a technician and discovered a problem with the uh, exterior of the wing. If that cultural change hasn't made its way to the medical area, that seems to be the juxta of what this committee hearing is about. Colonel Bachman, because of the process that he used, uh, uh, voluntary anonymous witnesses finds one set of consistent testimony, and he's got a very credible panel. Mr. O'Connor finds a very different set of um, availability of communications and, and independent communication avenues and finds that nobody is reluctant to come forward. Could this be a bias in sampling error? I mean, I remember the headlines, Dewey defeats Truman because the pollsters call only people that own telephones at the time. You got 80% to participate, Mr. O'Connor. Could it be that the 20% that didn't were part of Colonel Bachman's report? Could it be, and he suggested in his testimony, which was not his written testimony, that it may be an indication that there is continued fear on the part of some. So maybe I ought to ask Mr. O'Connor that, because you've read his, his report. You had 80 percent compliance. Could we have a bias error here? Could we have people making false accusations to the Bachman committee? Or could we have people that participated in his committee different than the 80 percent that participated in yours? That, and that'll be my last question. Well, sir, you've touched on several areas where there could have been differences. My, my review was conducted on it a little bit different method. Um, I uh, put the word out to people that they can come and talk to me about whatever they feel comfortable about. I did not do, use any leading questions. I used standard safety investigation techniques. I have to say that I got a lot more participation in this than I've ever gotten on one of these before. Uh, there were over 130 people who came forward or who answered my call specifically because I did reach out to some people that were on certain missions uh, that I wanted to make sure I had coverage of all, all the flights back through uh, 1987. And, and so those weren't uh, just people coming forward. They were me actually asking them to talk. So there, it was a little, little bit different method. Um, I also tried to define flight safety in a way that everybody understood meant, no kidding, impaired crew member in the cockpit. That is a different story than maybe flight safety from a generic view might be. Mr. O'Connor, if I might interrupt yes, you, sir. I want to make sure the chairman, uh, given these pending votes, has a chance to make any comments or ask any questions. So the chair recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Chairman. You know, I'll just make a quick uh, some observations. One, um, Mr. O'Connor, I'm a little surprised that your review was so narrow that it was that the charge was simply, as you stated, limited to uh, alcohol use on the day of launches. I would, would have hoped it would have been a broader view. 
Uh, Dr. Ocho, I am pleased that you're going to follow through with this anonymous survey. I think that would be, would be a, very helpful. Uh, Dr. Williams, uh, I, thought, I thought you had a very um, constructive testimony. I would like, if you would, you said you were going to accept, uh, ha had accepted and would accept most of the recommendations. If you would, please, if you would send to us a, a written statement on which recommendations you will not accept and why and what kind of reporting process you're going to have. And finally, it seems that, and again, uh, Colonel Bachman, you, you know, you have the most unpleasant <laughs> job here. We thank you for that. Um, uh, it seems that, that you were looking at a broader issue uh, with uh, more anonymous uh, reports, although anonymous face-to-face, -face, not just over the, you know, over the where uh, Mr. O'Connor was looking at a more narrow on the record. So I think this can, might play some some role there, and that's why I think, Dr. Oak, your, your, your surveys will be helpful. We're going to have to go, but I'm going to ask a question that, that I hope that you will answer when you come back, Mr. Bachman. I, I quote, peers and staff fear ostracism uh, uh, if they identify their own or other problems. That's a very troubling statement. What was your review panel's basis for making that statement, and how confident are you that it doesn't represent just the view of one or two malcontents, uh, particularly in uh, respect to the letter that came in from the various flight surgeons. And if you'll think about that and answer that when we get back. Thank you, sir. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We, the committee stands in recess. Uh, uh, we will return as uh, soon as we can. Thank you. Mm -hmm.